Lord Jesus, you are our rock. If we had not you, we would be left to ourselves, left to our own devices, left to our own wisdom, and worst of all, left to our own sham righteousness, which only offends our maker. But with you, in you, because of you, we have everything. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you have done to secure eternal life for us by your death, by your satisfaction of your Father's wrath against us, by giving up your life for ours. Lord, we ask today that as we sit under your word, you would be glorified, that we would be eager to hear from you and to be changed in all the ways that you intend. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You can turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll be looking at 2 Timothy 2.2 2 this morning. This is a continuation of our series in a philosophy of ministry. We're looking this morning at a critical piece of what a church must do. No doubt you've heard of Aesop's fables, and you are probably familiar with the fable, the moral tale about the goose that laid the golden egg. A farmer owned a goose, and the goose laid an egg he couldn't scramble nor fry, thought it was strange and then lifted the egg that weighed like lead, but was worth a lot of money. Sold the egg, figured out, hey, I I, I can make a lot of money with this goose. Comes the next day, another golden egg. Sells that egg, and greed sets in. The man figures out, you know what, I don't want to wait 24 hours for another golden egg. In fact, I can have everything now if I just kill the goose, split it open, and get all the golden eggs out from the inside. No more goose, no more gold. What was Aesop's moral of the story? Uh, Don't get greedy, maybe be patient, be content, love your goose, whatever. Um, What is the moral of the story for us? Train leaders. Leadership development is the goose that lays the golden egg. And if you don't take care of the goose, there will be no golden eggs. When it comes to ministry in the church, the local church and its leadership must be concerned about training leaders, developing leaders. There is a lot of ministry that must happen And we can be so concerned about the ministries that must happen right now. We must do all these things and take care of all of these needs that we never get around to caring for the goose that lays the golden eggs. That is the training up of another generation of leaders. The training up of a future generation of pastors. There's so much ministry to do right now, many pastors believe. I don't have time to train leaders. Imagine Timothy and the other elders at the church of Ephesus laboring in pastoral ministry, preaching, counseling, caring for widows, mending marriages, helping parents, teaching in various contexts, battling false teachers. How could they have time to train others? What would have happened if Timothy and the other pastors at Ephesus had taken that short-sighted view of ministry? The church would have died in one generation. Leadership development is the long, hard, slow process that we must hurry up and do. It's a competition between short-sighted and a long-sighted philosophy of ministry daily, weekly, year by year in the local church. No doubt you feel some of these similar pressures in various aspects of life. You feel the tyranny of the urgent displacing the things that may be most necessary. What I want to read to you this morning is our passage, 2 Timothy 2, 2. These are some of Paul's last words to his protege pastor in training, the young Timothy. 
He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who, be, who will be able to teach others also. The main point of the message this morning is this. A pastor's job description includes imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. A pastor's job description includes imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. We'll be looking at this verse in two parts, the sacred trust and reliable men. If you were to turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, we discover Paul's purpose statement for what we call collectively the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to pastors as they pastored churches about how to do ministry. Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 14 of 1 Timothy, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. And Paul writes to Timothy, and he writes generically, Timothy, this is how one ought to conduct himself in the church. And so these become for us something of the instruction manual for how to do church. And in this instruction manual is our text for this morning. Entrust these things to faithful men. Second Timothy is something of Paul's swan song. It is his last instructions to Timothy. The book closes with his recognition that he will most likely uh, not last much longer on the earth. And so it carries an urgency. And part of the urgency is that what Paul has taught Timothy must outlive Paul. It must outlive Timothy. And so we begin to first look this morning at the sacred trust. If a pastor's job description includes imparting the sacred trust to reliable men, what is this sacred trust? Notice in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says, the things, the things which you have heard from me, the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men. What are these things? These are the things which Paul says, you heard from me. There is instruction that Paul gave to Timothy, that Timothy heard from Paul, that Timothy then was to entrust to others who would be able to teach others still. The same phrase, the things you've heard from me, comes earlier in 2 Timothy. And back in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul tells Timothy this, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Very similar language in the first chapter of 2 Timothy. And the these things that Paul talks about there, the things which Timothy heard from him, Paul calls the standard of sound words. The standard of sound words. These are the things that Paul has taught publicly, house to house, synagogue to synagogue, in churches, by letter. These are the things that Timothy heard from Paul. They are the standard of sound words, healthy words, right doctrine, God's truth. Paul says something similar in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He says, for this reason, we constantly thank God that when you, Thessalonian believers, received the word of God, which you heard from us, in that case, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also perform, performs its work in you who believe. So this body of truth that Paul is talking about, which people heard from him, this apostolic proclamation, that truth that came from God through the apostles to churches, that which you have heard, Timothy, or that which you have heard, Thessalonian believers, is the doctrine of the apostles. It's the truth as God revealed it through that foundational level of leadership called the apostles. Paul, of course, was the apostle to the Gentiles, and so he was the one that went to 
nation after nation and place after place with this gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it's not just the gospel that people heard that Paul is referring to here, but the whole body of the full expression of the good news of Jesus Christ, which is summed up by that which you've heard from me. It is, in effect, apostolic doctrine or the truth of God, which we have now in the New Testament. Paul, in fact, often used this verb, heard, which you heard from me, in relation specifically to the apostolic message that he was delivering. And it wasn't simply about the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross in the place of sinners. It was about the implications of Jesus' death. It was about what it meant to belong to Jesus. It was about the knowledge of God that we acquire by being in Jesus. It was that which Paul delivered. He calls it the traditions which he taught in 2 Thessalonians, the practices which he commended to all the churches in 1 Corinthians 14, or the instructions that he gave in his letters that those letters were to be read to the churches, plural, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and Colossians 4. It was clear that what Paul had in mind and what he taught and what he spoke and what he wrote was the collection of truth that God was revealing to sustain the church. We have it in our day in the New Testament, the truth of God's word. Paul's instructions here to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2 are an implicit denial of apostolic succession. That is the idea that the apostles would have laid their hands on another generation of apostles who would lay their hands on another generation of apostles. Paul does not tell Timothy, Timothy, you're the next apostle. Do apostle things. No, in fact, Paul says just the opposite in Ephesians 2.20. He says the New Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles are the foundation of the church. And a foundation of a building is built once at the bottom and all the other layers and stories are built on top of that. It's not a, a layer of a foundation on a foundation on a foundation on a foundation so that you have a building of 20 foundations. No, you have one foundation which was the apostles and the New Testament prophets. That is God's direct revelation of New Testament truth before the Bible is written, collected, organized, and read by everybody. That truth from God directly revealed through the layer of leadership called apostles and prophets given in that first generation of the church. For Paul to tell Timothy, the things that you've heard from the apostles... And trust those things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Implies a denial of the idea that a second generation would be apostles receiving direct revelation. Otherwise, Paul would say, Timothy, listen closely to what God's going to tell you next week. No, he doesn't say that. He says, pay attention closely to what God already revealed in the apostles and the prophets. And faithfully transmit that down the generations. This is a denial of apostolic succession. The, the Roman Catholic idea that Peter was the first pope and he laid his hands on another and another and another and another. That view is historically untenable, um, but it's also biblically denied by passages like this. That what successive generations of the church were to do was not to have one man sit in a place and receive new information from God, but faithful men teach apostolic doctrine. Paul did not tell Timothy, carry on the torch of apostolic ministry. Look for ongoing revelation. In fact, the future of the church would depend on the entrusting of those foundational truths to faithful men. This is about training leaders, teachers. The church was not going to be able to go out and hire another apostle Paul. The church was not going to be able to install a new line of prophets to speak truth by direct revelation. Each successive generation of the church must train others to faithfully teach the truths given to the church in its first generation, to faithfully pass on the New Testament. What does Paul mean when he says in verse 2, what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses? This just means that Paul spoke openly, plainly. What he taught was no secret mystery. It was, in fact, widely known. 
Not some secret knowledge that only certain people could get in if they were well initiated. That was a prevailing view of how knowledge was acquired, especially spiritual knowledge and special knowledge. But not for Paul. Paul was a podcaster of the truth. And the things that Paul is enjoining Timothy to entrust to faithful men are the very things that Timothy heard publicly, often, over and over and over again. And crowds of people and churches and many audiences could all testify to these same truths. What does it mean when Paul says, entrust these things? Uh, The word to entrust means to entrust for safekeeping. In Acts 20, 32... Paul said that he entrusted the Ephesian elders to the Lord. Uh, The New American Standard translates it, commend. I commend you to the Lord. It's the same word as used here for entrust. I am entrusting you men that I love and care for and have invested in, and I'm leaving, and I'm afraid I'll never see you again. I'm entrusting you for safekeeping unto the Lord. In 1 Peter 4.19, Peter says that suffering believers... Believers under persecution and suffering and difficulty, they entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. We entrust ourselves, we entrust our very lives, even through suffering and in and through death, we entrust our souls to a faithful creator. This is essentially the same instruction that Paul gave to Timothy at the end of Paul's previous letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and have gone astray from the faith. That's how Paul closed his first letter to Timothy. And here in his last letter to Timothy, the same instruction. Guard what has been entrusted to you. So a pastor's job description includes imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. Let's talk about those reliable men. These are men who must be faithful, able. The the truths must be given to men who can be entrusted with the safekeeping and transmission of truth. These must be reliable men, trustworthy men, to protect and to pass on God's truth. Faithful here just simply means worthy of belief or trust, trustworthy, dependable, reliable. And notice the order of things here in 2 Timothy 2.2. What you've heard from me, entrust these to faithful men. In other words, find faithful men and then entrust them with New Testament truth. I think that order is important. There is an implicit danger in someone honing theology apart from maturity. Someone going after doctrine without faithfulness. You understand that bad men make good truth look bad. Men of bad character take good doctrine and tarnish it, soil it. Listen, every Christian needs theology. Every one of us in this room already is a theologian, right? We have thoughts and ideas about God. The question is, how accurate is our theology? I would never deny that Christians, every Christian from next generation ministries all the way up, pastor or not, any role, any place that you have in life, you need theology. You need right thinking about God. But there is a danger in giving immature men theological categories, theological vocabulary, and head knowledge. So that a man can learn some big words to bludgeon other people with. Or to have some big ideas to inflate his pride. To have theological conversation and a library of information masquerading as maturity. An immature man will hide behind theology speak and make himself untouchable and unteachable. 
And we've seen this. An older, wiser, godly man who can be intimidated by the theological verbiage of a young man with an unbridled tongue or unrepentant sin patterns or unrecognized arrogance. And so the older, godly, wiser man who's walked with Jesus for a long time is thinking to himself, how can I speak into the life of a guy who can talk theological circles around me? Never mind that this dear saint has been faithfully walking with Jesus decades longer than the young punk has been alive. One pastor wisely noted, your theology will not always move you in the direction of obedience because your use of theology is governed by the condition of your heart. You can't play leapfrog over your heart. You can't play leapfrog over your home. We don't play leapfrog over a character qualifications required for leaders. There's a reason that Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.22, do not lay your hands on anyone, that is, endorse somebody for leadership too quickly, lest you share in his sins. Go slow. In the recognition of leaders, go slow. Be careful what you endorse. There's a tension here. 2 Timothy 2.2 is this imperative, train leaders and trust truth to faithful men, but you can't microwave a faithful man. We need leaders now. Well, it's better to go slowly and build quality leadership than to rush this process and destroy lives and lose the truth. How do we know if a man is faithful? How do we know if a man is the kind of man who can be trusted both to preserve and to promulgate precious truth? We can look at what a man does with truth that he receives. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 3, Paul encouraged Timothy, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love. The goal of our instruction is love. How is that love described? Love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The goal of instruction is love, characterized by purity of heart, a clean conscience, and a sincerity of faith. That's the kind of man that we're looking for. A man who is faithful, who, who when truth comes into his life, it does not puff him up with pride, but rather engenders love. Love for God, love for people. Does a man love people? Or does increasing knowledge puff up his pride? Or does he exercise wisdom in the application of truth to his own heart and life? Do the great and glorious truths of God humble him? Or are they merely stimulation for his intellectual curiosity? Does a man confess his shortcomings as they are revealed in the word of God? Is he pricked in his conscience and, and eager to repent and be transformed? Or does he learn to avoid those truths that assault his sin and dwell only on the ideas that he can wield over others? Is a man given to pride or avarice? self-serving ambition? Does a man love power? Does a man love to be able to control lives and situations and wield authority over others? Does a man love to just play with ideas? Whatever idea is fascinating just around the next corner, I, that's new, I want to get a hold of that, turn it over in my mind, and, and play with it like a toy, and, and then I'm going to show off this toy to others. The truth is not a toy to be played with. 
but a precious commodity to be prized, protected, and passed on in season and out of season when it's appreciated by people and when it's not. Before the Lord, what does a man do with truth? There's a relationship between doctrine and character. This is why Paul tells Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. It's possible to go astray and to lead others astray. And when a man leaves the truth and leads others away from truth, it often reveals the character flaw underneath. Sometimes a false teacher is marked by secret sin and a seared conscience. This is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 19 and 20. He tells Timothy, fight the good fight, keep faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. There's a relationship between not keeping a good conscience and then abandoning the truth altogether. Some are governed by selfish ambition. 1 Timothy 1, 6 and 7, Paul describes some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion. And notice the desire in verse 7, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they don't know what they're talking about. You see, there's a desire for a position. There's a desire for people to listen to me. I want to be a teacher. And what's in place there is a selfish ambition. Jude 12 describes false teachers who are concerned only for themselves. They're in it for themselves. And Jude 16 t describes them as following their own lusts and flattering for personal advantage. Some see a, a place in the church or, or holding on to truth as having some sort of advantage in their lives, monetarily, position, status. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul describes those uh, who will tickle the ears and tell people what they want to hear. No doubt there will be people who crave such teachers, Paul says, but the time will come, 2 Timothy 4, 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And where there are people clamoring for such things, there will be teachers eager to meet that need. Titus 1 tells us there are those who teach falsehood for the sake of sordid gain. Romans 16 describes those who cause divisions in the church, trying to get people to follow after their ideas, who are in fact slaves of their own appetites. They want what they want. And Philippians 3 describes those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. That is, these are teachers who have infiltrated the church, who have tried to sell the church a brand of Christianity without suffering, without the taking up of the cross of Christ and following him. They are teaching a you-can-have-your-best-life-now theology. Uh, to, to, to die is Christ, sure enough, but to live, that's gain. So let's live now while we can. And, and these teachers had infiltrated the church and tempted the Philippians to follow after them. Paul warns the Philippians about them and says their God is their appetite. What they're really after is not you and your welfare, and they're not after the preservation of the truth and passing on the truth to successive generations. They're worshiping their own appetites, and, and they glory in their shame, those things that should have been shameful to them. They're, they're so-called Christian liberties. They're actually boasting in what they can get away with. And Paul says they are earthly-minded. Their end is destruction, he says. There are a lot of reasons, a lot of internal motivations that people have to go away from the truth. And a faithful man to whom the truth must be entrusted must be faithful to not alter the message, to not add to it nor subtract from it. Such a man must be faithful not to shrink back under persecution, 
Paul wrote numerous times, do not be ashamed of my chains or join in suffering with me for the sake of the gospel. A faithful man must be faithful not to bow to external pressures, faithful not to give in to internal compromise. This is why leadership qualifications demand that a man be not fond of sordid gain and free from the love of money. If a man is not free from the love of money or if he is fond of sordid gain, he will be tempted to compromise the truth for those things. They must be men of proven character, not giving in to selfish ambition. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.24, they must not be quarrelsome. That is fundamentally a lack of self-control in speech. And they must not be given over to speculations and fruitless discussions, 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 1, 6. What kind of a man is to be entrusted with the precious commodity of God's truth? A faithful man, a reliable man, a, a trustworthy man, a man in whom there is not a temptation to neglect or abandon or run away from the truth when pressures rise. But also, the man must be faithful, notice 2 Timothy 2.2, and able to teach, able to teach others. You've all perhaps played the telephone game. Stand in a circle, whisper into someone's ear, they whisper what you said to the next and the next and the next, and after 27 people, the message has changed. Some people try faithfully to pass on what they've heard. Some people just can't understand what was said. Some people try as they might, just don't have a great ability to remember what was said between when it was said and the next person I need to tell it to. Others lack the ability to clearly articulate the message to the next participant. And then there is always that one guy, or maybe that's you, who intentionally garbles the message, trying to create some creative outcome. The faithful man able to teach is not playing telephone game that way. But rather, he is to meet the standard of the ability required. He must be fit, competent, qualified. And notice what Timothy says here, or Paul says to Timothy, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach. Do you notice the future, future tense there? They will teach. They will be able to teach. Paul has four generations in view in this verse. Paul, Timothy, Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And the implication here is, uh, as one pastor said, Timothy is the second runner in a long relay. That after the others also would be others still, and others still to come after that. This is intended to be an unbreakable chain of the preservation and passing on of biblical truth until Jesus returns. Notice that Paul is not telling Timothy to hand over the reins of power, but rather to find men of good character who will be able to teach others the truth. This is why one of the qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy 3 is that a man be able to teach. And in Titus 1.9, an elder or a pastor must be the one who holds fast the faithful word. Holding fast, there's that idea of preservation, safekeeping, that word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. There's that teaching side of it, and it has both its negative and positive, teaching the truth and refuting error. This is a pattern for the protection and transmission of apostolic doctrine, of New Testament truth, from one generation to the next for the life of the church. Consider church history. In 2,000 years, in the places where that chain has been broken, 
and it has been broken again and again and again. And men have failed to uphold 2 Timothy 2.2 and to do what this verse tells Timothy to do. And there have been churches which have held on to the truth and faithfully proclaimed the gospel for generations. And there have been churches that faithfully proclaimed the gospel for a decade. And then they're off the scene. Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. The church at Ephesus that Timothy pastored, that Paul spent three years ministering to, that the apostle John most likely served at, that Priscilla and Aquila were there, Apollos was there, a rich history, that church doesn't exist today. You can't go find that church and see the list of faithful pastors who obeyed 2 Timothy 2.2 and entrusted faithful men who would be able to teach others also, who entrusted faithful men to be able to teach others also, who would pass the baton over and over and over again down to this day. In fact, there's no church on earth that dates back that way. And where men have failed, Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church and the head of the church, the savior of the church, the one who purchased the church with his own blood, has been faithful. He promised that, Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But that still leaves us with this remarkable responsibility. Men like John Huss and Martin Luther picked up a baton that was all but lost and ran with it again. By God's grace, we have the Bible in our language. By God's grace, we hear the gospel. And there is responsibility on all of us as a church, on the leadership of any local church, to maintain gospel witness and to protect and pass on the truth of God's word. Listen, if the gospel is lost, what are churches for? What hope is there for mankind if those who have been tasked at the preservation of the gospel drop the baton? There's no other savior. There's no other remedy. There's no mediator between God and man except the man Christ Jesus. Only Jesus, death on a cross, proclaimed to sinners, saves there's no other message. There's no other hope for a lost and dying world but the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And if the church goes silent with the gospel, and if the church goes silent in its proclamation of the word of God, then these things shall not be heard by a mass of humanity running headlong into destruction. The gospel must not be lost. The truth of God's word must not be lost. And so we must preserve, protect, and pass on these truths to another generation. So how do we find these faithful men? Where do we get them? Are they on Amazon.com? Can you just go click a button, find a faithful man, and trust these truths? How do you make faithful men, develop faithful men? Do you, do you inherit them? Do you hire them? Even if you were to hire them or inherit them, where did they come from? Were they just born that way? Identifying and developing men who can faithfully lead the church, protect the truth, and pass it on to others is a critical task of the local church. Part of pastoral responsibility, according to 2 Timothy 2.2, is, as one man said, delegating the gospel deposit. I don't believe churches can abdicate this responsibility. A seminary certainly doesn't create faithful men, though it might be effective in entrusting them with truth. The local church is the, the nest for the development of faithful men. Think about how do we go about doing that? How would Zach, Can, Ryan Mitchell set out doing that in Papua New Guinea? What's, what is the task there? Well, they have to move there. And then 
learn the trade language and then learn the dough language and then learn the people and begin to translate God's word into the dough language and then begin to teach God's word and preach the gospel and Where are you going to find faithful men amongst a group of people who haven't heard from their creator since the Tower of Babel? You're going to preach the gospel, translate God's word, open God's word for them, and then teach and disciple and teach and disciple. Leadership development will be the goose that lays the golden egg in Papua New Guinea. (laughs) Because what the church needs is eventually faithful, qualified elders who can entrust the truth to others so that the gospel survives one generational gospel proclamation, transcends one group of hearers, and goes from tribe to tribe to tribe in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And listen, Zach and Amelia and the whole team have a lot of work ahead of them. They could say, we don't have time to train leaders. And yet it is fundamental to church planting. It's fundamental to the task of missions. What about at Grace Bible Church? How do we train leaders here? Well, if someone walks in the door not knowing Christ, we preach the gospel. And someone is growing in Christ and you begin to see who is God raising up in our midst that takes the truth in and and applies it to his own heart and and is growing, who is growing in faithfulness, faithfulness in all areas of his life. And, And then you entrust that man with these things. You'll have on on the screen behind us here a slide that sort of details, and it's too small to really see. Unless you look at the back wall and then it's even smaller. Um, At the bottom, in that bottom circle, depicts the men who are at Grace Bible Church. All the members and regular attenders at the church. And you know that every September, the, the elders encourage all the men in the church to participate in this ministry we call Build. And the idea there is that we would build in disciplines of faithfulness to the men of this church. So that they would be fantastic worshipers, to know God, to pursue him, to to love him, to open their Bibles and seek him. And then for that pursuit of God to spill out over into the lives closest to them, into their homes, their marriages, into their kids, into roommates, into classmates into various spheres of influence that a man has, and then out into the local church. And and in that ministry, the the men are taught how to handle God's word and how to develop these disciplines of faithfulness. Men who do build well, men who are faithful in that ministry, who uh, do the homework that's assigned and and uh, demonstrate the things going on in their hearts, reflect this priority, are invited to another layer of leadership development. It's called the trust, where we uh, pour theological categories and vocabulary and, and start thinking about precision in doctrine and precision in hermeneutics with the men of this church. Because when uh, the, the layer of leadership that uh, serves this church now dies off, That needs to be backfilled with faithful men who have been entrusted with truth, who will be able to teach others also. Biblical counseling training off to the right is a way that all of us can be equipped to handle God's God's word well in our own lives and in each other's lives. Shepherdology is a ministry to train people who are in shepherding leadership roles at the church. Small group leader training is a way that our small group leaders are trained on a regular basis to shepherd in small groups. The Expositor's Seminary is a dotted box up there that men are being trained to faithfully handle God's word and to shepherd God's church through a four-year master's degree program um, here here on campus. And then there's an elder internship leading men towards an evaluation of whether or not they would serve at Grace Bible Church as pastors, as elders, as shepherds here. And then the elders undergo uh, training and evaluation throughout their ministry and time. Uh, that schematic, that flowchart, uh, 
um, was produced after those ministries were in place. Just by way of full disclosure, the elders of Grace Bible Church did not come up with a master plan about how are we going to train men and let's do all of these things. No, honestly, we were just desperate to try to do something with 2 Timothy 2.2 and passages like it and how do we invest in men for the future. And so the, the pastors of this church from its very early days were shepherding men to think about the build disciplines to care for their own hearts and their homes, to aim at ministry qualifications, and to learn how to handle God's word. And, and this church has seen the fruit of that ministry, such that we could add other layers to that and continue to train men in accordance with the word of God. Training leaders is hard, slow, at times discouraging and unfruitful, <laughs> But it is the goose that lays the golden egg of future ministry. You think about a, a small town, rural town, country pastor uh, where there's one man and his task is to preach every Sunday and care for all the needs of the people. How does that man have time to teach church history and Greek exegesis and systematic theology to a next generation of pastors? Nearly impossible. And God has been so kind to this church to give us a group of men who are passionate about this very thing. And God has just been kind. It takes a long time, and so we must hurry up and get started. If a man does not multiply himself this way, a decade goes by and he still hasn't multiplied himself and he's more busy than he was and has less time to multiply himself. We believe this is something a church must aim at at its foundational level. Equipping faithful men to safeguard and pass on the truth is critical to the life of a church, both for the present and for the future. In the present, equipping men well means an accountable pulpit. It means the shepherds of this church can't get up and just say whatever they want to say when people on the front row have their Greek New Testament open. It means accountable shepherding. People who know their Bibles well understand what pastors must do and be. Sometimes ministries have a fear of well-equipped people because discerning people can keep some pastors from letting people into the secret stores of knowledge that only the pastor has. Listen, a faithful pastor just wants you to know everything the pastor knows to know Christ, to know him well, Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, that they might know God, that which is beyond knowledge. Paul was not threatened by Bereans who opened their Old Testaments and fact-checked his preaching. There's a tremendous benefit in the present for this mindset of training. And there's a benefit in the future. There will always be those who come along who oppose the truth, we read some of those passages earlier. 2 Timothy 2.18, men go astray from the truth saying the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. People teaching bad things come in and harm sheep. People must be trained and equipped and ready for those challenges. The church must be equipped with men who can protect the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. Training men protects the, true, the church from being personality dependent, right? What happens when the indispensable communicator dies? I'll never forget being in Russia and wondering why there were no men in the church over 30 years old when we visited. It's because during the era of persecution, whoever was preaching disappeared midweek. Nobody ever heard from him again. His wife lost a husband, kids lost their dad, church lost the pastor. Okay, who's preaching this week? Next. And he lasted a few weeks and was removed. And another and another and another. And the communist persecution emptied the church of its men as men stepped up to lead and to care for God's people. We have to extend the church's witness beyond this generation. The truth must 
survive us. This principle isn't only about training pastors, right? This begins in next generation ministries. You who faithfully teach our kids week in and week out, thank you. You're laying the foundation for this very thing. Women teaching women according to Titus 2, the Wellspring ministry and the Titus ministry and various ways that women disciple women in this church falls along these same lines. And we'll close this morning with Jesus' words about what we have been entrusted with. This is Luke 12, 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And in many generations and in many faithful churches, you have done that by the means of a Paul training Timothy and a, a Timothy entrusting others with those truths and others teaching others beyond them. Many in this church have benefited from ministries that sought to do this very thing. And God, may we be faithful as a church to protect the truth and to pass on the truth. What a great and rich treasure we have been entrusted with. Would it prevail? Would it expand in this valley and to the ends of the earth? And may we be faithful in that relay race, carrying our baton, passing it on faithfully for your glory, for the building up of your church. In Jesus' name.